our gracious Heavenly Father. We thank you again for the privilege and the opportunity that's ours to come into your presence through our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. I ask that the Holy Spirit strip away that which is said which is not true, but seal to our hearts that which is truth. We long to grow in grace and knowledge of you so that you may receive the glory and the honor. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're going to continue on in our study in our uh, epistle to the Philippians. And I have strongly felt the need to hover over these verses for a while. I'm not really sure that I've made myself uh, clear in uh, the past several videos as to really what's going on here. And I, I just want to, and I think it's so important that I hope that you'll bear with me. I don't, I don't really see any rush to, any reason to rush through this study anyway. And uh, we're all looking forward to leaving here this spring. I hope our Lord returns for us. If not, well, we're doing the best thing that we could be doing, and that is we're staying focused on His Word. It's a wonderful privilege just to be able to still, at this present time, to have the opportunity to, to just study His Word uh, without persecution. Folks, you know, none of us know what direction the Lord is going to take this world as far as end times prophecy is concerned. We could wake up one morning and they could be burning Bibles. I, I encourage you all, I, I implore you, in fact, to take and stay focused on His Word in these final hours before His return for His church. There is nothing in this world that we could possibly do any, that, that, would, that would mean any more than that as far as our spiritual life is concerned. As we await our blessed hope, uh, we're going to try to make it through the, the epistle to the Philippians, verse by verse, and I have no idea we're going to go where we'll go from there. It's, it's, I've, I've asked you to help pray for the direction of this ministry, and I see God doing that. I really do see him directing this ministry. Uh, in our last study, we were around somewhere around the 16th, 17th verses of chapter 1. So I want to try to shed more light, folks, on what we are seeing here in the opening chapter of this epistle. Now, since the early church didn't have a published Bible like we do, we need to see that this is the Holy Spirit speaking not only to a body of believers at Philippi, but to us also who know and love the Lord. And what we've just seen is that in this particular situation where the Holy Spirit has Paul in prison, there are brethren waxing confident who are being made confident. The word is python. It's, it's, the word means persuaded. They were, they were persuaded because of Paul's situation to preach Jesus Christ. Some of them were preaching out of envy and strife, but some of them were preaching out of love. Now, and there are those who suggest that there are two classes of people. We're looking at two classes of people here that are doing the preaching. One, non-believers who are not preaching truth, and the other, believers who are preaching truth. And I, I don't think that you can do that with the text. These are brethren. These are people redeemed by the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul calls them brethren these ones who are preaching truth. I don't believe that you can make the text say that some of them are not preaching truth and some of them are preaching truth. 
And furthermore, I don't I find no indication any place in the Word of God that the Holy Spirit rejoices when error is preached. So I must come to two conclusions immediately from this present context. And that is that these are brothers in Christ and that they're preaching truth. So what we're looking at is not the content of what they say, but the motive behind it. Some of them from envy and strife, some out of love. I do not consider that to be unique only in the church at Philippi or in the area at Rome where Paul was a prisoner. Dearly beloved, listen, to, there are those, there are, well, there are many, many people who know and love Jesus Christ, who know the truth, who speak the truth, but who are envious. You know why should God give this particular this? Why should God give this person the this kind of ministry, the ministry that He has? You know, Christians today have become indoctrinated to, to a religious system whose motives are looking at numbers and the people and the success of a minister. You know, his the degree of fame, popularity, influence. What are you know? within the Christian community. Well, and actually within the Christian and, and non-Christian community. And none of those are pure motives. The only motive for proclaiming truth, folks, is love. In all of the years that I've known the Lord Jesus Christ, in all of the opportunities that I've had to hear others preach, in my judgment, one of the, the best sermons that I ever heard preached was by a former prison inmate who truly, truly loved the Lord because he preached Christ. And I was, I was part of a prison ministry that went there to minister to him. It was a circle uh, discussion where you put the chairs in a circle and it's open discussion. It was in a small prison chapel. And I have zero doubt. No, I have zero, no doubt that what must have immediately went through the minds of some of us who heard him preach was that, man, this, this man should not be preaching here. I mean, you know, we got to get this guy out of jail. I mean, this, this man ought to be heard. Apparently, God wanted him to preach to a few inmates and guards in the county jail. This brother really knew the truth of the Word of God, and he knew how to expound on it. My heart, listening to him, my heart was touched. And yet I was utterly amazed at how quickly I thought that this man ought to be promoted or that he shouldn't be where he was. You know, that others ought to know. More people ought to know about his ability to expound upon the Word of God. And there are many Christians who want to be heard I have a message to proclaim. You know, I see Paul declaring here through the leading of the Holy Spirit that he is set, he is, he is appointed, he's placed where he is for the defense of the gospel. Is it possible to preach truth out of envy and strife? Well, without question. Without question, much of evangelical, conservative Christianity, and I'm talking primarily about you know the, wor the world religious system based on human merit that goes by the title of Christianity, uh, is, it's motivated by impure motives. 
I don't think it's straining the text at all to suggest that there are brethren confident preaching from impure motives. Impure motives. On the other hand, there are many preaching out of love. And I'm persuaded that the great uh, heroes of the faith, as, as we, we, you know, as a, we tend to call them, most of the great heroes of the faith during our present time are unknown. Surely the Holy Spirit is desperately serious in Corinthians when he tells us that the messengers who carry the gospel are made the filth and the off-scouring of the world system. Difficult for me to comprehend that the Holy Spirit is, is really in many of the highly popular movements. So here are people who have been made confident by what they've seen. It's a shame that we're not totally confident by what we see in the Word of God. They saw it in Paul since they didn't have the Word as we have it. I believe that we see in Paul a ministry characterized by the Holy Spirit. Let me, let me set it in context. Some of these know the truth and they speak truth and many of them cause strife in doing it. It isn't that... It, it's not... It's not that there's perversion of doctrine or fallacy in truth, but the very aspect of their ministry is one which causes strife among Christians. The Word of God declares that we should be very careful not to cause strife and division among brethren. The others preach Christ out of love, knowing that I, says Paul, knowing that I am appointed or placed for the defense of the gospel. The other out of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds. Here we see a definite statement that the things that concern Paul are ordained by God. You know, it's 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 really unbelievable to me as I as I listen to sermons and watch programs concerning uh, Christ and Christianity that. You know, what a tremendous emphasis that there is on the power of God that you ought to be utilizing. You know, you, the power's there, you, but you got to tap into it. You know, mostly as it regards physical, material things, of course. I mean, if you're sick, you pray and you get well. That's what you do. If, if, you're, if you're poor, you pray and you get rich. If you're not happily married, you pray and it, and it all gets worked over very nicely, very neatly and nicely. And, and God is seen as something sort of like a genie, you know, you know, that pops out of a bottle. You know, if you just rub the rub the lamp or the lamp, you know, if you rub the lamp just right. Or if spirituality is the focus, it's it's, oh, you know, oh, so and so he did such and such and God's going to pay him back. And we hear this all the time. You know, that, that victory in the Christian life is a goal for which we strive by means of self-effort. Christianity is a, is, is a religion, just like any other, where that victory is, is something that we achieve, that we strive for, that, that we try to attain to by means of self-effort. That's typically how Christianity is thought of today. And I don't, I don't care from what direction you're coming from. I've, I've, I've made so many videos talking about a world religious system based on human merit. We're living at a time in human history we have for the, just nearly the past 400 years or more in which Christianity, literally biblical Christianity, has been turned on its head. It's not anything like what this Bible describes. Typically, usually, normally, on the outside, from the out, from looking in on, on Christianity, if you were an observer, standing back, observing Christianity, it would not reflect the words of this text very much. Not today. And I know that's a difficult concept for people to grasp, but... 
uh, you know, that, vic that victory in the Christian life is a goal for which we, 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 we strive to attain by means of self-will, self-effort, ba law, basically, law. Okay, we ought to all be paragons of virtue and success and and probably walk around in white suits and white hats, you know, so that everybody in the community knows that we're Christians. I'll tell you what I see. I see Paul, the millionaire, happily married, Pharisee of the Pharisees. Now suddenly he's in jail broke as the, just as broke as the Ten Commandments. And what we see in Paul is a criminal who's, who's lost what we would consider to be material success and material goods. Surely he longed for the companionship of his wife. I mean, think of the devastation of the life he's, he's lived for Christ. If there is any illustration of setting our affection on things above, surely it's here. If we glance ahead, we're going to read, you know, just turn the page. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Chapter 4, verse 4. Verse 11, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. Bear in mind where Paul is. I don't think it's it's any exaggeration at all to suggest that Paul was a very, very wealthy man. He, he lost it all because of Christ. Paul was very influential and he lost it all. He lost all of that reputation. He lost everything because of Christ. How would modern how does modern Christianity today look upon such a thing as that? It can't possibly be seen as success. It's most often viewed as failure. Paul had an excellent reputation. He lost it because of Christ. Three times beaten, shipwrecked. What was it? Three times beaten, 40, 40 lashes or 39 lashes. Shipwrecked. in peril of my brother and in fear of criminals and in fear of my countrymen, often in times in hunger. I don't, I don't see in Paul anything whatsoever of the success stories that I hear pro proclaimed today for the most part. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm speaking, I'm, you know, I'm not, this is talking about primarily what we what we see and we hear in modern Christianity today, you know these things that characterize the Christian life. That that just doesn't seem to characterize the Christian life to be broke and in despair and in hardship and suffering. And well, you've 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 brought all this on yourself. And what do we see? The Holy Spirit telling us here that Paul has us has him right where God, God has Paul right where God wants him. Maybe, maybe we uh, have this, uh, we all have this, this initial reluctance to, to accept such a, an idea as that. We don't, we, we don't want to, we don't want to think that way. We, we want to think in terms of success. You know, well, if I was just, better at what I was doing, I wouldn't be in this situation. But I hear him say, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Well, come on, Paul, why don't you get out of prison? You know, what do you mean you can do all things through Christ who strengthens me? Well, you know, where's your money? Where's your reputation? Where's your success? Where's your freedom? If you can do all things, why don't you just get free? You know, they, they, they saw Christ could do all things. He saved others. Can't save himself. You know, they taunted him, if you remember. You know, if you be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Could he have done that? Well, of course, he could have, he could have done that, but he couldn't have done that and redeem you. 
Surely the I can do all things through Christ whose confidence strengthens me would indicate that what he is saying and what the Holy Spirit would have us see is that strength is perfected through weakness. Oh, but no, no, no. Oh, no. No, we don't want to think in those terms. Strength is perfected through weakness. Someone has to be moved out of the way to make room for Christ. Could it be actually be the Christian himself that's the problem? Could it actually be self is the problem? And most Christians don't think in those terms, but that is exactly what we see in the scriptures. You know. And so I believe the message from the Holy Spirit is that it's not what we see in the life of Paul, not what Paul can see or feel or experience. I don't know whether Paul was hungry or not hungry. I, I, I don't know whether he was sick or well, but I know absolutely his attention and his affection was settled on things above. If I didn't know Christ, I'd be greatly concerned about things in modern evangelical Christianity today is concerned about. Folks, I praise God that we as believers in Christ can live with our minds settled on things above in a jail cell chained to a guard. Why would I rejoice in the midst of that? I'll show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake, said the Lord. You know, the biblical concept of suffering for his name's sake is what I hope to, to bring to the surface in this epistle. And you might be surprised to discover that it's, it's not a willful choice on the part of the Christian to suffer for his name's sake. Well, I got up this morning and, and yeah, and today I am going to suffer for the, na the, the, na the sake of Christ, for, suffer for the sake of his name. I'm going to, that's, that's my plan, plan of the day. I'm going to suffer for his sake. We have the whole wrong idea about what suffering is. Not only the nature of, of the suffering, but, but how that, that suffering comes about, arises in our lives. It, you know, what exactly is that suffering a result of? Well, we know it's preaching the gospel, but, but a lot of people preach the gospel and they don't seem to be suffering too severely for Christ's sake. I want to focus on that. I want to, to sharpen our minds our senses to discern, to be able to discern the truth and separate truth from error as, as it concerns our suffering for his name's sake. You know, we, we, we're going to see words like affliction in the text. We're going to see words, you know, like the word suffer. Uh, we're going to see a word, words like opposition. You know, there's a lot of things that, that's going on, a lot of factors involved that make up the whole body of our suffering for his namesake. But we can be suffering and, and believe that we're suffering for his sake or for his namesake or suffering for the sake of Christ and not be doing that at all. Whether, whether the motive be pure or impure, and I rejoice, says Paul. In fact, I'll keep on rejoicing. You know, we see a present tense and a future tense both in that verse. I do rejoice and will in the future rejoice. They were expecting to add affliction to Paul's bonds. Make Paul's imprisonment more difficult. I hear the Holy Spirit saying that there is rejoicing when Christ is preached, even if the motive is not pure. That, of course, that doesn't excuse the motive. But it does tell me that, that God rejoices when Christ is preached. And it does tell me that we, as Paul, could, could look at these individuals 
and know that God is at work in them both the will and do of His good pleasure, that we are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God at work in us both the will and do of His good pleasure. But we rejoice in the fact that Christ is preached. I think we need to, to be extremely careful about preaching half of Christ or mixing a lot of humanism with the gospel of Christ, with the gospel of the grace of, of God. Grace is not a merit system. God is, listen, dearly beloved, God is not blessing you and caring for you and loving you in return for your love and service for Him. God is not blessing you and caring for you and loving you in return for your love and service for Him. We stand before God on the basis of grace. So there is joy when Christ is preached, even though the motive may be impure. There is joy when Christ is preached. I know that this shall turn to my salvation, he says, through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Christ. And right away we read that, so the word salvation, and we... We, we make that say redemption. And that's not what I'm seeing in the text at all. Now, I'm going I'm to suggest several avenues for your thinking on this verse. And, and as this verse has been studied, probably the most common position is to take salvation here as redemption. I've, I've spoken a lot about this in, in my videos I know that the preaching of Christ is the basis of my redemption. The problem with that, well, is that, you know, uh, by means of or through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ would seem to indicate that there is synergism in redemption. You know, that, that Paul's redemption is based upon the preaching of Christ, the prayers or the worship of the saints and the Spirit of Jesus Christ. When, when redemption is based solely upon the finished work of Jesus Christ, and that is it. Uh, another possibility, I suppose, is that the word salvation here means freedom from prison. Well, I know that I'm going to get out of prison. And I think that view is very popular. I know that I'm going to get out of prison. There are many Bible students who have come to that conclusion, but we have to be careful with the word salvation. Salvation is not a synonym of redemption. So they would say, what he's talking about here is Paul's deliverance from prison. The problem in my mind really with that idea is that first of all, we have no idea whether or not he was released from prison. The suggestion is that he's going to get out of prison by the preaching of Christ, their prayer, and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And it seems to me that that's also a difficult conclusion to reach. It's a very popular opinion, though. Another problem with that view, uh, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by, or by death. That doesn't sound like he expects to be set free. The one thing I know for certain is that nowhere do we even see the slightest hint of human merit involved in this picture. The 20th verse makes it extremely difficult for me to take the 19th verse as though Paul is saying, you know, I know that I'm going to be uh, set free from prison. In order to get out of that, many I think many Bible students teach that he was in fact set free from prison, but we don't know that. There's not solid evidence that that happened. There is circumstantial evidence that that may have happened. We don't know. We just don't know. So I'm going to suggest a possibility. I know, I absolutely know that this is going to turn to my deliverance from what was at least intended to be added to my bonds. If his attention is settled on things above, then the fact that Christ has preached is what's going to deliver him from that increase of pressure in his bonds. 
those words supply of the spirit of Jesus Christ okay we, we don't understand it. how can we understand the Paul's words of the supply of the spirit of Jesus Christ how, how can we understand that really understand it until he first until God takes and strips everything away you know leaving us to trust him just trust in him and him alone i mean think get a get a picture of i got a picture of job in my mind here uh i can it's 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 one thing to trust him when you know everything's you know you know everything's going great in my life and you know are you trusting the lord oh yeah yeah i'm trusting the lord uh, how's everything going? Oh, nothing's going well at all. It's, you know, everything's just a mess. And I just, you know, I'm having trouble trusting the Lord. Surely it's occurred to you, you dearly beloved, precious souls for whom Christ died. Surely at some time or at some point or another in your life, it's occurred to you that it's when we find ourselves in, in certain situations that, that that God has designed for us that we we find it a lot easier to really trust in him situations that may be uncomfortable more than uncomfortable in fact uh, perhaps even dangerous I can explain from my standpoint what the prayer of and the supply of the spirit of, of Christ means, you know, in my own life. I think that you could do that in your own life. If I take this as Paul's deliverance from the distress of his present situation, his joy being in the fact that Christ is preached, that's, that's the way I take the verse. Surely the context is seeing the temple of clay in which Paul re resided as was a tool in God's hands. If God wants me in prison, folks, no place I'd rather be. God wants me ill, nothing I'd rather be. God wants me well, well, that's that's super. <laughs> that's great. God wants me free, fine. You know, it doesn't matter. We will hear Paul say in this epistle, I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. And I, and I get messages I've gotten messages from Christians over the years. Uh, you know, if I'd saved them, I could have wallpapered my whole house. Well, I, I just don't understand, Steve, why the Lord would have me be going through this, what I'm going through. This is it's a horrible, hor and, you, and your heart goes out to these people. And, and immediately it's, it's you, you, you want to take and caught, you know, comfort them and reach, you know, and, reach out and embrace them and try to and and if we're not careful folks we will be coddling self it's impossible for me to take and separate my feelings and my emotions so, just, you know, to say, well, okay, I understand that what you're going through is just so horrible. You know, and I, and I really feel for you here. You know, I really, I hurt for you. You know, I mean, it's, you know, and maybe I've been through that. Well, maybe I haven't been through that. But, you know, it's, you're telling me that you're suffering in, in this particular way. And, then, and that you don't seem to see a purpose in it. And. I I have I have to tell you I've got to tell you that there is a purpose in it. I understand it's not pleasant, but God has you right where He wants you to be. I can't I can't personally my fo myself folks I cannot imagine myself wanting to be somewhere else other than where I knew God wanted me to be. Or if, if God was working in my life in a certain way, in a certain area, that I would just want to jump out of that, over off into, jump out of that into something else, into some other place where that, 
you know, the remedy, you know, is comfort, not, you know, the opposite of suffering. Relief from pain. Relief. You know, and just to find myself outside. It's the same is true about us when we, in dealing with one another under grace, folks, the temptation for us is to take and redirect a person's life, try to instruct them. In, I don't know how to put this. Look, we're under grace. We're not under law. All right. I'm not going to come to you ever. Okay. Ever. I will never come to any one of you and try to tell you what I think that you ought to be doing for Christ. Never. There is a danger in me directing you away from what God is doing in your life. As we go, it's, I think it's important as we go through this study that we see that we really focus in, hover over these verses long enough to spend some time, some serious meditation time on what we see taking place in the life of Paul, who was the example of all of us who believe. Now, we can't separate the Word of God from our physical circumstances. And I hear Christians every day telling me that there are certain things that they should do in order to do. Well, uh, in order to do just, just that, separate us from all unwanted difficulty and hardship, affliction and suffering. We don't want any of that stuff. You know, which suffering is, is biblically you know, suffering is directly related to the preaching of the gospel. I, I've got to emphasize the fact. It's not that, that, that hitting your thumb with a hammer, is, it's not that that's not suffering. Okay, that's suffering. Believe me, I, I can tell you, I can tell you that that is. Or, you know, getting knocked off, you know, your horse, you know, and hitting the ground hard. You know, that's suffering. Or getting stomped on, stepped on, you know, by your horse. There's a lot of things that we could we could call suffering. But there is a a suffering that is directly connected to related to the preaching of the gospel itself which is uniquely interwoven, interrelated to the preaching of the gospel. It's a unique special one of a kind suffering. That's related to the preaching of the gospel. And we're going to see that as we go through this epistle. Our, 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 our circumstances are always constantly changing. Now look, I'm not trying to lay a guilt trip on, on anybody here. Alright? Uh, but you know... Uh, you know, Lord, I love you dearly and nothing uh, could ever stop me from studying your word uh, unless, well, unless my favorite TV show, you know, my unless my favorite show is on TV. You know, it seems to me that's the way that we, we often, as Christians, handle God. You know, we loudly profess our love, but the very way in which we live makes it clearly evident that we really don't love him very much. And I hear the Holy Spirit telling me in this verse that my love for God includes my body. Rejoice always and again rejoice. And if you think for one second, Paul decided in his own strength and by his own will that he was going to take the, the high road here in the midst of extreme difficulty and rejoice always, you don't understand. You don't understand that that is the natural result of the new man that can do nothing else but that. Okay? It was a work of God in, in, in Paul's life that allowed, that brought him to the point of being able to say these words and to, and to do what he did. It wasn't just some decision. He woke up one day and decided, yeah, today, I'm, today's the day. Today I'm going to, yeah, today I'm really going to love God. Today I'm really going to rejoice. Today I'm going to, 
that's what modern Christianity would think. It's just, it's, it's kind of like, you know, it's, it's like the old army thing, you know, be all you can be, you know, you're a Christian, be the best you can be. And, and if you're not the best that you can be, well, now you've got a reason to hang your head low and you've got a reason to feel ashamed. This is getting into the area of the old man, the new man. I mean, you know, uh, only the gospel of Christ, okay? It's only the, only the gospel itself could do such a strange work in our lives as, as this. To be sitting in prison with nothing rejoicing in everything okay if you think that you can just do that apart from and i mean with the right motives if you if you just do that apart from understanding the the true nature of the gospel then i i just i hardly know what to say It's, it's strange. It's a strange work on God's part. It's, it's amazing how the, he will take us, a Job, and set him down and, you know, strip everything away. And here's this poor, pathetic individual. He's lost everything, and yet he's, and yet he's, he's, openly acknowledging that God can take it all away or God can give it all back. It's not the natural reaction of the old man to do that. And, and when we try to set about it just with this or anything else, try to set about go about in our day to day walk and relationship with the Lord. If if our mindset is into you know, well, God is just going to bless me. I'm not going to have any problems if I'm doing everything right. Then 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 when you go about and you think you're doing everything right and those problems come, now what are you going to think then? We are not our own. We're, we were bought with a price. Okay? Bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We belong to Him. He can do whatever He wants to with us. Second Corinthians chapter 7. Therefore, having these promises... Dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of the flesh and of the Spirit. I see the Holy Spirit saying, It is the desire of, of one whose attention and affection is settled in things above, that even in the body Christ will be magnified. I wish you could either highlight in your Bible or write down, take a sticky note, put it on your fridge, okay, that you... Our strength is made perfect in weakness. Okay? It's when we're weak that we're strong. Our, our weakness, our inability, our depending upon Him to do for us what we know that we could never have done on our own. And, and that's what brings peace, joy, rest, and all, you know, love, and just, just all the rest. I just wanted to make sure that we understood before we went on, I wanted, I wanted to get a, a proper sort of background of, as to what's going on as we continue to go through this study. In Philippians, in the third chapter, I believe, uh, somewhere around verse, verses 9, 10, 11, we're going to see something very remarkable. We're going to see that, that Paul's, in, in Paul's words, and we're going to break those words down very carefully, All of that which God, we know that God, God is God's will for our life, that, that God desires uh, that we uh, uh, 
uh, I don't know how to put this. All of all of that 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 success story. If you wanted to, you know, if you're going to write a, a book and you're going to call it the Christian success story, you know, the successful Christian life, the victorious Christian life, the abundant Christian life, the deeper Christian life. If you're going to anything like that, you know, any any just the the mere idea that there would be something that w our lives could somehow manage to be conformed to uh, something which reflected what we read on the pages of, 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 of this epistle. That this would come about as a result, not of our own strength, our own power, our own will, our own savvy, okay? But we're going to see something very amazing here. That... In fact, all of this comes about as the end result, that which we should desire. It all comes into our experience as a result of, and only as a result of, guess what? Our death to self. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Thank you so much for hanging with us on uh, throughout this study. It's not getting a lot of views, but then I think a lot of people's interest is is on other things and that's okay god has those listening that he wants to have listen here he has me doing exactly what i'm doing and uh for that i just thank god for that i thank god for all of you i thank you for all of your your kind warm uh loving comments that you leave know that i'm praying for you constantly please continue to pray for the direction of this ministry i love you all i truly do until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.